Welcome to the ABA Journal's Modern Law Library podcast. I'm your host, Lee Rawls, and this week we have a real treat for you word nerds. I have with me an associate editor and lexicographer from Miriam Webster. Her name is Corey Stamper, and she's the author of a new book, Word by Word, The Secret Life of Dictionaries. Corey, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Lee. So I don't know how much you know about lawyers and their really deep love for language, but we at the ABA Journal certainly do know and get letters all the time about language and usage. And I think that some of our audience, you probably have their dream job. Can you talk about how you became a lexicographer? Well, it was really kind of an accident. Um, I started college as a pre-med major. I was going to go to med school. I was weeded out of that pool very quickly by organic chemistry. And I ended up becoming a medievalist. So my focus was on early language and literature, which meant Old English, Latin, Greek, Old Norse, Middle English, you know, highly, highly profitable fields. I left school with a BA. I worked a job in finance for about a year, and that didn't go so well. And after about a year, I was looking for a new job. And I happened to answer a want ad in the paper for an editorial assistant for Merriam-Webster. And that was about 20 years ago. And here I am today. One of the things I really enjoyed about your book was your description of the building and your working conditions. You said that, you know, often a lot of people kind of picture, oh, it must be like a temple to language with high ceilings and fluted arches. And really, it seems like you lexicographers are in tiny little tiny little dens all clutching your clutching your you know word files to you can you talk a little bit about what the atmosphere is like in Miriam Webster absolutely the office building is very um, unassuming it's an office building in fact it is not some vast library with soaring arches the first floor of our building is where all of our customer service staff and all of our marketing folks and sales folks all work so it's like any office. And then upstairs is the editorial floor. And the editorial floor is so quiet that it puts most libraries to shame. People are sort of scattered all over the floor in their cubicles. There's very rarely talking. There's very rarely any kind of face-to-face interaction. The nature of the work is so intense that you really need that kind of solitude in order to focus well. So once you go upstairs to the editorial floor, um, it's, I imagine it actually sounds a lot like you know, a room full of lawyers studying for the bar. <laughs> it's just silent. So if any of you out there listening really miss your Carol, your study Carol, I think that that's more or less the vibe. So Corey, Absolutely. I'm about to out you to our listeners. You, by your own admission, are one of the foremost defenders of the word irregardless. And I thought that would be a great way to illustrate to our listeners how you kind of came around on the word irregardless and discovered this, you know, long kind of complex history. Could you talk a little bit about why irregardless, which I think is some people's pet speech peeve, uh, is definitely a word and belongs in the dictionary? I am happy to, as America's foremost irregardless apologist. Uh, When I started my job, I, like, you know, the vast majority of Americans thought irregardless was a disgusting word. I, I believed it was not a word, which is something we're all told. I thought that it was illogical. It was unnecessary. Um, And I didn't realize that I thought this until I was at work and I started answering consumer email. And we had someone write in just frothing at the mouth over what I assumed was a supposed entry in our dictionaries for irregardless. And I went to respond and say, well, that's ridiculous. We would never enter this word in the dictionary. And in the process of answering, I discovered we did, in fact, enter the word. And that really got me wondering, so what is it about this word that everybody hates that merits entry into a dictionary? And so I started doing research about the word. Now, oddly enough, irregardless is completely non-standard. It is not a part of standard English. And so therefore, if you use it in contexts where standard English is expected, you will absolutely be pilloried for it. That said, it's a word that's over 200 years old, and it keeps showing up 
in edited printed prose, and not even as an example of bad usage. People just use it. And as I started really sort of pulling all of this evidence apart, I realized that in some dialects of English, irregardless is actually an intensive form of regardless. It's used to sort of forestall any further discussion on a point. And once I realized that, I realized, you know, this word that in print and in standard use that everybody hates actually has this really rich textural use that you only get if you are a native speaker of one of those dialects where irregardless is normal. And so I, you know, I myself don't use irregardless, but you'll be surprised at where it pops up. I mean, in fact, I have seen irregardless appear in the transcripts of oral arguments for Supreme Court cases. So, you know, that's a pretty formal setting. And and it still sort of slips out. So I have a I have this sort of appreciation for irregardless. It's kind of clung on to the whole of English. It's this barnacle that no one can get off. But it does have this really beautiful use that lots of people miss. I also think that it would be useful for especially our lawyer listeners to talk about, you know, if you break people down into two camps when it comes to language use, Broadly speaking, you have the prescriptivists, like our own Brian Garner, who writes a monthly column for our magazine, yep. or descriptivists, like myself. Could you please describe um, the difference between the two camps and why this is such a just a passionate debate over whether we should be prescriptivists or descriptivists? Absolutely. So... Prescriptivism and descriptivism is this dichotomy that came about the first half of the 20th century. And there are two approaches to language, to both language description and study. So the prescriptivists, chief of whom is Brian Garner, they believe very firmly that English is really led by its best practices. And so it prescribes certain uses. That's where prescriptivist comes from over and above other uses that are deemed as either being less correct, less common, more liable to trip people up. So that's what prescriptivism is. Descriptivism is sort of the other end of the spectrum. And what it does is its approach to language is that all language is valid, that if people use it, then it should be described. It's a descriptive. Now, The big issue with that, and I imagine that many lawyers are hearing this saying, well, obviously prescriptivists are better people. Why would you not be a prescriptivist? But the fact is, is that American dictionaries, frankly, since the time of the, you know, probably about the mid 1800s, have been descriptive in nature. Our goal is to collect, arrange, and define as much of the language as possible. And that means not just saying things like we're going to put irregardless in, but that also means giving some sort of information about particularly contentious uses. So irregardless is labeled non-standard. But those are the two, two ends of the spectrum. Now, I tend to believe that it is not actually a true dichotomy. A really good dictionary is not going to be wholly descriptive, it will include some prescriptivism, because part of describing the language is also describing how it will be heard and how it will be received. It's about setting things within context. And honestly, a good prescriptivist is also, to a certain degree, descriptivist. Um, Brian Garner's latest uh, usage guide, which you know I got like everybody else when it came out, he talks about how a lot of his opinions he has decided to back up not just with sort of the body of prescriptivist usage literature, but also with data. And there are places in the most recent edition of Garner's Modern English Usage where he has shifted his view in light of the data. So yeah, that's what prescriptivism and descriptivism are. Um, I think people simplify them because it's much easier to just sort of say descriptivists are people who care about language and or prescriptivists care about language, descriptivists don't. But in fact, it's a lot more complicated than that. This also reminds me of a debate that has gone on in the American legal community since the Constitution was written, which is, 
is the Constitution a living document or a dead document? And you and your book argue very persuasively, English is a living language. It is always changing. It is always evolving. And I think that for many lawyers and lawmakers, that can be a bit threatening because how do we then know what someone 80 years ago meant when they wrote a law or a regulation? Um, right. Yeah, that's an excellent point for lawyers, especially. Uh, I often actually get a lot of email from lawyers who will say things like, I'm arguing a case and I need the definition of property from your 1890 dictionary or from your 1957 edition of this dictionary because they recognize meaning changes and they need to place meaning within a certain historical context. This usage of English and especially of dialects can really rear its ugly head in a courtroom where only standard English is considered an appropriate use, and you may have a witness who does not use standard English. Um, you wrote about the Trayvon Martin trial, and one of the witnesses was really discredited, and it was all based on the way that she spoke. Could you talk a little bit about that incident and the follow-up by linguists after the trial about her testimony? Yeah, absolutely. So the witness in consideration is Rachel Jantel. She was on the phone with Trayvon Martin as he was being pursued and shot by George Zimmerman. So, of course, her testimony, her deposition was incredibly important to establishing the order of events in the case and, and what was going on. Now, during her deposition interview, she said that she heard someone yell, get off, and when she was asked, could you tell who it was, the transcript of that deposition indicated that she first answered, I couldn't know Trayvon, and then later, I couldn't hear Trayvon. Now, so that's the deposition. When she was in the courtroom being examined, there were many points where the defense attorney would ask her to repeat herself. The jury claimed they couldn't understand most of her, you know, most of her responses. She was asked many times if she understood the questions presented to her. And the whole reason that that was there was not just because she was a young woman, but also because she speaks three different dialects of language. She speaks standard English, a dialect called African American vernacular English, and Haitian Creole. So, so there was definitely some dialect confusion in the courtroom. Now, after the case ended, John Rickford, who is a sociolinguist in California, took uh, transcripts of the trial, looked through her deposition, and he is a specialist in African-American vernacular English. And what he did was he wanted to see, was it the case that she was just not communicating clearly, or really was it an issue of she was speaking a dialect that none of the other people in that courtroom understood? And he focused particularly on the transcript of her deposition. And when he heard the recordings that were played in court, he heard instead of, I couldn't know Trayvon, or I couldn't hear Trayvon, I could, and it was Trayvon. And he says, you know, in his study, he said he would need to hear a better recording. But he goes on to say that she didn't say what the transcripts report her to have said. It was that the person transcribing her deposition did not understand African-American vernacular English. So this is a really fascinating case where dialect really has far-reaching consequences in the courtroom. And it really makes you think a lot about how we privilege standard English over and above many other dialects, and so don't even think that people might be speaking other dialects when they're giving testimony or when they're a juror. It's been my experience, especially when, say, getting into fights on the internet, that um, people use a dictionary's definition, a standard English definition, to argue points and support their own case but could you tell us a little bit about how what we now know as standard English came about? Uh, because I think a lot of people treat it as though it was handed down by God 
on several thousand <laughs> stone plates. Um, right. Who was actually making these decisions and deciding what's quote unquote proper and what's not and developing this into standard English? Yeah, this is a fascinating history. Um, lots of people assume proper English is just, as you said, has always been and shall always be forevermore. The fact is, is that really prior to the mid to late 1600s, there was no such thing as proper English. However you spoke was proper. <laughs> if you spoke English, that was what you spoke. Really starting in the late 1600s and early 1700s, there was this huge boom in literacy in England. You had this huge social shift going on. The aristocrats, who were the moneyed and highly educated people, were losing influence. And at the same time, these merchants, the merchant class, was gaining both money and influence through global trade and through the decline of the aristocracy. So what you have is you have suddenly the creation of the middle class. And for those merchants who are now mixing with higher class people, we started seeing writers write books that told them how to write elegant letters, letters that would be understood by educated people, how to undertake business letters in a way that was decorous. And that led to then grammar books specifically for native speakers of English. These people who were coming in and might have had rudimentary education were now getting a lot more education through these books. At the same time, you have a group of folks that are neoclassicists who are looking at all of the ways that English has been growing over the last couple hundred years. And it's been, gro I mean, it just booms in the 14, 15, and 1600s. We have so much contact with so many other parts of the world that English is really becoming a global language for the first time. And the neoclassicists are a little nervous that English is getting a little out of hand. So what they start doing is they start advising that English, perhaps, in order to be a language of record and in order to last, that it should maybe model the other languages of record, the primary one being Latin. So in the 1700s, that's when you start seeing people, notably John Dryden, he was a he was one who put forth a lot of uh, these rules that we've sort of codified as being part of standard English. You start seeing these men writing in their own writing things like, well, I translated my letter from English into Latin and then retranslated it back into English. And because Latin doesn't let you do things like split infinitives or doesn't let you do things like end a sentence with a preposition, because that's Latin grammar, you started seeing some of that carried over into English. And this was really the beginning of proper English, this idea that there are types of English that are less beautiful, less elegant, and therefore, even in some extreme cases, less worth preserving than other forms of English. The other thing that's fascinating is the norms for what standard or proper English have been have changed dramatically over the years. This is one of the things that I really love about Garner's book is he will give you a history in his usage books of contested usages. And sometimes it's fascinating to see things like the use of above as a noun was once considered absolutely horrible. <laughs> so to say all of the above was a terrible thing. It was a sign of your uneducated, miseducated mind. So yeah, I mean, English is a living language and standard English is a living language. It also has a beginning point and it has an arc. It continues to change. Yes. And I've had to uh, get into arguments before about the word y'all, which I did not grow up using. <laughs> I grew up in central Illinois, but I worked for a newspaper in North Carolina. And in taking other languages, I realized, oh, they all have a type of word for you know, the plural form of you. And we just don't. So we're, when someone says y'all or use guys, they're just trying to make up for a defect uh, in the English language. Right. They're just trying to clarify what is already there. I think what's so fascinating about y'all is y'all in some parts of the country, like I'm from Colorado and I have lots of family in Texas. In Texas, y'all can actually be singular. And then all y'all is plural. So I might have a cousin come up to me and say, y'all coming to the picnic. 
and then point to the rest of my family and say, all y'all are invited. So even y'all has been, you know, as y'all has been sort of pulled into the singular realm, people are adapting. So it's all y'all now. Yeah, I hear it. (laughs) And uh, when you look at when English spread, so all of a sudden we in America are divorced geographically from England and you have Australians who also, you know, natively speak English, many of them. It's interesting to see how the language diverged. The word quite, I learned just recently. In America, if I say, you know what, that's that was quite nice. That's more like an intensifier. And I guess in Great Britain, it's almost an insult. It's like, well, it almost made it to nice, but it, you know, it fell short. And I realized that I'd been having conversations in which I was coming away with the complete opposite idea as the person who I'd been speaking to. What kind of divergence do we expect to see in the future? Do you think that as a global community, we're more likely to synthesize or do you think we'll still keep growing apart in words and their usage? Uh, I, th- I think both and. <laughs> I think the, the thing that's great about where English is now is that we have speaking communities outside of traditionally English speaking countries that are taking English as their language and adapting it for their own uses. And some of those uses are coming back into, you know, they're coming back to the homeland. You'll see them in Britain, or you'll see them in America, or you'll see them in Australia. One great example of this is the verb prepone, which is Indian English, and was, my guess is, probably coined by uh, English-speaking Indians in call centers or in tech support centers in India. And it's it's a beautiful verb. It means it's modeled on postpone. So it means to reschedule something prior to the originally scheduled time. Oh, and oh I don't have a word for that. That's amazing. Okay, isn't that pre-pone. An am- pre-pone. Isn't that an amazing word? And it's, it's beautiful. It sort of sh- it shows that they've grasped the rules of English morphology. They get that pre and post are suffixes and that pone is the verb core. So... Prepone, you know, was primarily in Indian English, and now I'm starting to see it in business literature in the States. So there is still going to be some of that sameness because we're a global community. We communicate much quicker and with a broader diversity of English speakers than we probably ever have before. At the same time, you know, language We haven't seen this sort of collapse of dialect or collapse into one standard form, right? So there's still British English and there's still American English, even though we've had lots of contact with each other. There's still Australian English. Within America, you know, you can slice up American English to be, you know, six major dialects or 285 different dialects. So I I think that the dialects, this sort of differentiation helps us sort of claim a particular identity within the language. And I don't see people giving up that identity very easily. And I also think people switch dialects. I mean, when I lived in New England, I found myself saying things like wicked, (laughs) which that's wicked for that's great. I never would have said that in Colorado. When I go back to Colorado, I find myself saying howdy. That's nothing you would ever say in New England. So I think that we are going to see sort of this unification in certain ways. There's going to be more vocabulary shared back. But I also think, you know, those dialects are our identities. So those will continue to proliferate, I think. I think I want to end off on talking about language as we use it in politics, the political ramifications of language. The Merriam-Webster Twitter account has recently gotten more attention because it seems like when an event happens nationally, maybe a word that has to sort of refers to that event will be defined by Merriam-Webster on Twitter. What made your social media folks decide to be engaging with their audience like that? I, I like it. I think that it brings sort of a living element to 
dictionaries rather than thinking them as stuffy things that sit on shelves. Yeah, absolutely. So we've actually been doing this on Twitter for uh, almost 10 years now. And the idea is people come to our website. We have this website where people look up words. And in-house, we can see what people are looking up and what they're looking up when and how many of them are looking it up. But that's not public information. What ends up happening, though, is you're right. Events happen, and people will go to the dictionary to look up words surrounding that event. And not always the words you think. Sometimes the words are more sort of social commentary on what's happening. Sometimes the words are difficult words that were used During an event, sometimes they are reactions to an event. And after a while, we thought, you know, we have all this data, and we think it's cool, but no one else knows that, you know, hey, millions of you right now are looking up the word pre-pone. Why are you looking that up? So we we decided on our Twitter account, we're just going to tell people this word is spiking in lookups. And after a while, we were like, well, let's figure out why. So then we'd say... This word is spiking. Y'all are looking it up a lot. And this is the event, the news story, whatever that's driving that lookup. Now, as all of your listeners know, the last couple of years have been very interesting politically. And have, and there's been a lot of focus on language in a way that we haven't seen in any other election cycle. Which means that, you know, when Donald Trump says you know, these guys are bad hombres and ombre spikes. And we say, everyone's looking up ombre um, and they're looking up the right ombre with the H and they're also looking up the wrong ombre, which refers to hair coloration without the H. Suddenly people are, ah, they're being political. The fact is, is we're not choosing to be political or engage politically. What we're doing is we're always engaging culturally. We're holding up a mirror for our users to see What are things that other people are really interested in right now? And that has been so fascinating with this recent election cycle and this administration, because our sense of things is that people are caring so deeply about what words mean, the full meaning, nuance, connotation, everything else. And they're also, in some ways, starting to fact check their politicians, their reporters in ways that we haven't seen before. So, if, you know, for instance, Kellyanne Conway used alternative facts and fact was the top lookup for days. People, It's not that people didn't know what fact meant. They wanted to make sure that we had not changed it because an administration official had used it in a way that they weren't sure of. So it's been this really fascinating journey for us to see And to engage with people this way, people feel so strongly about words. And I think that's one of the brilliant things about what we do on social media is that every day you get to see just how strongly people feel about words and about their use. And that's a really rare thing to be able to share. Well, Corey, thank you so much for joining us. This has been just so fun and illuminating to hear. Her book for my listeners is Word by Word. The Secret Life of Dictionaries. And Corey, if people want to discuss this with you further or look up other things you've written, where can they go and how can they do that? They can go to my blog. Uh, You can find it at harmlessdrudgery.com. That is an excellent, excellent uh, URL there. (laughs) And so fitting, too. Well, thank you all for joining us for this episode of Modern Law Library. Please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes or whatever your preferred podcast service is.